director of the Hebrew University, Professor Strunze, the head of the University Research and Development, Professor Shai Arkin, the director general of the Hebrew University, Billy Shapira, <coughs> deans, provost, dear guests. What I wanted to say is a lot, and I think that I'll leave it for the first session of the colleagues or fellows of the Buber Society. I commit myself, I hope that I'll be invited. This evening is about learning. You didn't have any doubt then that when Professor Schulman opened the evening, it was not just greetings. We learned already something. We are going to learn more than something during this evening. Professor Shavan, we are most grateful for the initiative. We are most grateful for the way you conducted it in two parliaments. We are most grateful for the years to come. And we are most grateful that we share with the same language, which is the only language that a modern state will be using, the scientific language. We do not have any hope in Israel. A world of enmity, of religious, religions and religious speech, but the scientific language. Thank you for using it. Thank you for adapting it. Thank you for being so consistent. And let's hope that we are all successful as you were, you have been success successful in what you have been achieving until now. Good luck to us. So let us celebrate tonight in the knowledge that this is a moment of grace and very good fortune, a moment in which we are creating something that will, I am confident, make a difference in the lives of many young scholars, in the lives of their universities and institutions, and in the life of the mind in our two countries. Herr Präsident, verehrter Herr Botschafter, Frau Professor Strumsa, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, von Martin Buber stammt das Wort, alles wirkliche Leben ist Begegnung. Wenn ich die vergangenen vier Wochen zurückblicke, dann gibt, gab es in diesen Wochen bewegende, erfolgreiche Begegnungen im Kontext israelisch-deutscher Beziehungen. Ich denke an die Regierungskonsultation, an das Treffen der Minister beider Regierungen, und es war eine gute Erfahrung, auch im Gespräch mit Kollegen Herschkowitz zu spüren, dass auch manch anderem Ressortkollegen klar wird, Politik muss diese Sprache lernen, die die Sprache der Zukunft die die Sprache ist, die einzig im Prinzip Verantwortung des Hans Jonas uns hinterlassen hat, gerecht wird. Als Hans Jonas vom Prinzip Verantwortung sprach, es ist 30 Jahre her, hat er vieles von dem schon vorweggenommen, was wir heute diskutieren, wie eigentlich sieht verantwortungsvolle Politik und wie sieht ein verantwortungsvoller Dialog zwischen Politik und Wissenschaft aus, sodass wir, salopp gesprochen, ein gutes Gewissen künftigen Generationen gegenüber haben können. Vieles ist geschehen, das eher mit schlechtem Gewissen verbunden sein muss, wenn wir an politische Verantwortung denken, weil es nicht nachhaltig war, zu sehr auf den, heutigen, auf den jeweiligen Tag und eine kurze Weile ausgerichtet, aber nicht langfristig. Das war die gute Erfahrung bei der Regierungskonsultation. Und ich freue mich sehr, morgen den Kollegen wieder treffen zu können in Haifa. 
Vor einer Woche dann der Besuch ihres Staatspräsidenten Simon Peres in Berlin mit einer großen Rede im Deutschen Bundestag. Kollege Murmann aus dem Deutschen Bundestag und ich haben diese Rede gehört und Sie wissen und Sie alle kennen Feierstunden und wir sagen dann oft, es war eine bewegende Rede. Es ist ein vergleichbares Vokabular, das wir oft sagen. Das war viel mehr als bewegend oder groß. Es war eine ungewöhnliche, dramatische Erzählung mit nahezu literarischem Charakter. Es war eine Stunde im Deutschen Bundestag, die uns alle mit großer Dankbarkeit und auch mit großer Zuversicht den Blick auf Gemeinsamkeit und gemeinsames Wirken für künftige Generationen erfüllt hat. Und heute sind wir hier. Ich sage es für meine Delegation, Mitglied des Deutschen Bundestages, Herrn Dr. Murmann, den Präsidenten der Humboldt-Universität, Herrn Professor Marx, die Präsidentin der Universität in Potsdam, Frau Professor Kunst, Journalisten, Mitarbeiter aus der Wissenschaft, manche, die in den letzten Monaten auch stark mitgewirkt haben, gearbeitet haben dafür, dass wir heute die Martin-Buber-Gesellschaft eröffnen können. Wir freuen uns, wieder hier zu sein. Und heute Morgen habe ich daran gedacht, es ist der hundertste Tag der neuen Bundesregierung. Es ist meine erste Auslandsreise wieder und ich finde es wunderbar, am hundertsten Tag der neuen Legislaturperiode der neuen Bundesregierung hier bei Ihnen sein zu können. Alles wirkliche Leben ist Begegnung, ist so fanden wir auch ein guter Leitgedanke für unser großes gemeinsames Projekt, die Martin-Buber-Gesellschaft. Ich möchte allen sehr danken, die in den vergangenen zwei Jahren mit uns diskutiert haben. Hier vor allen Dingen an Ihrer Universität, an der Hebrew. Diejenigen, die viel Erfahrung haben, die viel erzählt haben von der besonderen Tradition der Hebrew und es war uns dann doch bald klar, jetzt ist die richtige Zeit, um eine neue Initiative auf den Weg zu bringen, die sich richtet speziell an die junge Wissenschaft und die sich konzentriert auf Arbeit im Bereich der Geisteskultur und Sozialwissenschaften. Die Tradition der Entwicklung der Geisteswissenschaft, der Naturwissenschaft ist allen hier Anwesenden bekannt. Auch die wechselseitigen Gefühle von Überlegenheit und Unterlegenheit, das Ringen der, wie man zeitweilig geglaubt hat, Welten des, der einen und der anderen, es ordnet sich neu, entsprechend dem Stand von Wissen und Erkenntnis, den wir in den Natur- und Lebenswissenschaften wie in den Geistes- und Kulturwissenschaften haben. Wir wissen, in der nächsten Phase der Entwicklung von Wissenschaftssystemen wird nicht allein die Kultivierung von unterschiedlichen Welten in dem Wissen, im Wissenschaftssystem von Bedeutung sein, sondern das Knüpfen von Netzwerken, Organisation von Begegnung, Begegnung der verschiedenen Fakultäten und Fachbereiche und Wissenschaften in der Welt der Wissenschaft, Netzwerke, Begegnungen zwischen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern, aus unterschiedlichen Nationen, Kulturen und Religionen. Das war eigentlich immer schon so. Forschung war immer 
international, global ausgerichtet. Aber jetzt sind wir in der Phase, in der wir über die Förderung von Forschern und Forschergruppen hinaus auch noch einmal auf neue Weise, das war die Idee, Foren schaffen, einen, in, einen strukturellen Ansatz finden, um dieser nächsten jungen Wissenschaftlergeneration das Signal zu geben. Es sind uns Fragestellungen, es ist uns die Arbeit im Bereich der Geisteskultur und Sozialwissenschaften wichtig. Wir sind davon überzeugt, dass große Fragen, die in der Physik, die in den Technikwissenschaften, die in den Lebenswissenschaften bearbeitet werden, mehr als je zuvor das Gespräch mit den Geistes- und Kulturwissenschaften brauchen. Nicht in dem alten Sinn, der oft beklagt worden ist, dass ein Techniker sich auf den Weg, Weg macht, etwas zu entwickeln, ein Naturwissenschaftler sich auf den Weg macht zu neuen Erkenntnissen und dann der Philosoph oder der Ethiker beauftragt wird, mal im Nachhinein die Erklärung zu all dem zu finden, für Akzeptanz zu sorgen, die Ethik hinterher zu liefern, aber möglichst nicht zu stören im Prozess der technologischen Entwicklung. Der Dialog, der, für den sich, auf den sich Geistes-, Kultur- und Sozialwissenschaften heute vorbereiten sollten, ist ein Dialog, der eine sehr, eine sehr viel höhere Verantwortung für die Geistes- und Kulturwissenschaften und Sozialwissenschaften bedeutet. Eine höhere Verantwortung im Blick darauf, dass die Welt der Naturwissenschaften und der technologischen Entwicklung, an der wir alle hoch interessiert sind, die wir mit vielen anderen strukturellen Maßnahmen ja auch fördern, den kritischen Blick, die Orientierung, auch die Maßstäbe für technologische Entwicklung aus eben den Geistes- und Kulturwissenschaften braucht. Das gilt für technologische Entwicklung, aber es gilt eben auch für den interkulturellen, für den interreligiösen Dialog. Und deshalb freue ich mich sehr, dass uns gelungen ist, gemeinsam ein Konzept für ein solches Forum, für eine solche Gesellschaft zu schaffen. Sie ist nach Martin Buber benannt, nicht nur wegen dieses viel zitierten Satzes und seines großen Werkes, sondern immerhin war es Martin Buber, der 1905 einen Aufruf für die Gründung der Universität, einer Universität in Jerusalem mit Hebräisch als Lehrsprache unterschrieben hat, der hier an der Hebräischen Universität eine Professur für Sozialphilosophie übernommen hat. Und ich übertreibe ganz gewiss nicht, wenn ich sage, dass in dieser großen Gestalt das Erbe der jüdischen Kultur in besonderer Weise Verkörperung findet und vor allen Dingen mit Martin Buber sich verbindet, ein herausragender Beitrag zur, zu so etwas wie einer humanistischen Mission, humanistischen Mission der Wissenschaft, humanistischen Mission aber auch an dieser Universität. So finde ich, er ist ein leuchtendes Beispiel, er verkörpert viel von dem, was uns durch den Kopf gegangen ist, als wir über die Gründung dieser Gesellschaft und dieses Fonds nachgedacht haben. Ich möchte herzlich danken denen, die in den letzten Monaten die heutige Eröffnung möglich gemacht haben. Ich danke Herrn Professor von Grävenitz und Frau Professor Strumsa. Sie haben viel unentwegt Kontakt gehabt, sind so etwas wie Mutter und Vater des Ganzen geworden. Grevenitz kann heute nicht dabei sein, lässt herzlich grüßen, es geht ihm schon wieder besser und er wird dann bald auch nach Jerusalem kommen. Sie haben 
die, uns die Chance gegeben, dass aus der Idee, aus, der allerersten, aus den allerersten Überlegungen ein gutes Konzept geworden ist. Ich danke Professor Diener und ich sehe Professor Morsche Zimmermann, ich erinnere mich an unser Frühstück. Da haben Sie bei mir eigentlich die ganze Sache in Bewegung gebracht. Es war ein Frühstückstermin, bei dem mir klar wurde, es ist jetzt der richtige Zeitpunkt für eine solche neue Initiative. Ich danke Herrn Professor Rapp aus München und Frau Präsidentin Kunz, die ja auch heute hier ist, für ihre Bereitschaft, im Stiftungskuratorium mitzuwirken. Und schließlich gilt mein besonderer Dank Ihnen, verehrter Herr Professor Schulmann, dem Direktor des Stiftungsfonds, dem ich für seine neue Aufgabe alles Gute wünsche. Ein Zeichen an die nächste Generation junger Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler, dass wir uns wünschen, in Israel und in Deutschland, dass diese nächste Generation zueinander finden kann, dass es in dieser nächsten Generation, künftigen Generationen der Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler neue Netzwerke, Interesse aneinander geben möge und eben jene Begegnungen, von denen Martin Buber gesagt hat, wo die möglich werden, ist wirkliches Leben. Und wo wirkliches Leben ist, gerät vieles auch in Bewegung hin zum Lebensförderlichen, gerät vieles in Bewegung hin, Leben zu entwickeln, Leben zu fördern, eben an jener Humanität zu arbeiten, die wir uns wünschen, für unsere, in unseren Gesellschaften, in den Beziehungen unserer beiden Länder, in dieser Region und international. In diesem Sinne herzlichen Dank für alles, was auf den Weg gebracht wurde. Alle guten Wünsche für den Start, ganz besonders, ich schaue in ein paar junge Gesichter, ganz besonders für Sie, die Jungen, die von uns wissen sollen, dass, uns, dass wir das mit Leidenschaft betreiben, Weichen zu stellen, Zeichen zu setzen, die Sie ermutigen mögen, aus der Perspektive der Wissenschaft, mit den Möglichkeiten der Wissenschaft an einer Welt zu wirken, die besser ist als die Welt des 20. Jahrhunderts. Das ist unser großer Auftrag für das 21. Jahrhundert. In diesem Sinne, Shalom. Minister Schawan, President Ben Sasson, dear colleagues, dear friends. In October 1951, when Martin Buber retired from the Hebrew University, the then rector, uh, Professor Moshe Schwabe, a renowned classicist, said addressing Buber, and I quote, I know that your personality will continue to bestow its light on our faculty members and students. I am convinced that with the help of Toseon, the divine, the deeper understanding of which was your life work, you will create new institutions. I am convinced that these institutions will help people take roots in the soil of the eternal ideas whose work in human life and endeavors you sought to explain. Thus, Schwabe. It is such an institution that we inaugurate today. Looking for models, not to say father figures, for a German-Israeli endeavor that combines the humanities and the social sciences, it was first suggested to name the society after two German-Jewish intellectuals from the foundation period of modern social sciences, the philosopher and psychologist Moritz Lazarus and the philologist Heimann Steintal, 
who in the mid-19th century founded together the Zeitschrift für Völker, Psychologie und Sprachwissenschaft. But the name of Martin Buber, a towering figure in philosophy, religious studies, and sociology, imposed itself. Buber, a founding father of the Hebrew University, was the foremost German-speaking Jewish intellectual in Europe in the 20th century, and the most outspoken advocate of reconciliation between Jews and Germans after the Second World War. As in any academic meeting, the lecture is the core of the event, and before we move to the lecture, if the director opened and the president welcomed and the minister inaugurated, it is my role to conclude the introduction, the pre-lecture part of the evening, and I would like to conclude with acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge the role of Professor Miri Gourarie, the previous vice rector, in shaping the new institution and formulating its first declaration of intent. I wish to acknowledge the enormous help of Professor Gerhard von Grevenitz and his wise and forthcoming advice throughout the creation process of the Society of Fellows. There are other friends here whom I would like to acknowledge, whose help I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, uh, Mrs. Derpinghaus Pastor and uh, uh, Professor Marxis and others. But first and foremost, I'd, I would like to acknowledge the vision of Minister Chavan, who a year and a half ago announced the establishment of this new institution with a generous gift of the German, German government and set into motion the preparations and discussions that led to today's event. Minister Chavan closely followed the development of the plans and her vision is the, is the one that stands at the core of the institute we now inaugurate. For this, we are enormously grateful and I hope that the Martin Buber Society of Fellows for the Humanities at the Hebrew University, for this is the full title, will be worthy of the friendship of her lofty vision. Thank you very much. Bundesministerin Professor Chavan, the President Professor Ben Sasson, Director Professor Strumsa, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. In 2005, an inconspicuous novel was published by the German language author Daniel Kehlmann, bearing the laconic title, Die Vermessung der Welt, Measuring the World. In record time, it climbed the bestseller list and occupied a top position for an exceptional long period to come. The smash success of Kehlmann's novel <coughs> astounded the literary experts. The author was no less surprised. Kilman could not explain the exceptional popularity his novel enjoyed. All he had aimed at, as he put it humbly, was to create an ironic portrait of scientific curiosity, accompanied by a voracious greed for precision and amplified by what he regarded as a remarkable German habitual frame of mind. The novel exposes the voyager and natural scientist Alexander von Humboldt investigating the external physical world and the mathematician and astronomer Carl Friedrich Gauss, a monkish explorer in the monastery of his own mind, while portraying them with subtle humor and in lucid mode. Indeed, the inconceivable success of Die Vermessung der Welt appears to have touched a sensitive nerve in the current zeitgeist. It seems that the novel's significance rests upon its deeper meaning as a tracer for a kind of intellectual recovery. A recovery and revived awareness, so to speak, for the fundamental import and meaning of practical enlightenment, contributing to the world's disenchantment, its Entzauberung. 
In fact, it seems highly probable that in times of weathering of tradition and forgetfulness of canon, with obviously awkward results for historical judgment, the question of enlightenment with a turn to the practical world struck a kind of ubiquitous chord of spiritual need among the reading public. Literary critics in the English-speaking world have quite appropriately depicted Kelman's novel as embodying the emblems of a passion for precision, the delights of exactitude, so to say. Precision is a virtue of knowledge. Its honor cannot be impinged by rendering it ironic, not even when Kilman evokes on the narrative stage Humboldt efforts and extended regime of self-denial to craft the merits and prerequisites of knowledge. So during his early studies at the Berg Academy in Freiburg, Saxony, compelling himself to wind his way through narrow mine shafts and passageways in order to gain mastery over his incipient claustrophobia, or when he performs psychological experiments on his own body in order to investigate the conductivity of muscle fibers, or when for the purpose of measurement he endures the icy cold of the Cordillera Mountains and in oppressive heat the hordes of mosquitoes swarming along the Orinoco River, or when bonding himself to the prow of a ship five meters above the sea's billowing surface, a sextant in hand to examine the height of the waves. By describing the obsessions of practical reason ironically and with a grain of comedy, Daniel Kenman's novel Measuring the World still remains quite ambiguous to the pressing request of modernity. However, the novel's spectacular success resolves its intrinsic ambivalence. As a seismographic shift in disposition, it seems bringing the prevalent, quite universally extended proclivity to discredit enlightenment and to berate modernity to some kind of a halt. Indeed, modernity and enlightenment stand in ill repute these days. That misgiving has various reasons. It is called to task for the crimes committed in the wake of Western expansion across the seas and is held liable for the draconic practice of early modern social disciplining within, the bending, tailoring, and adapting men to conform to the needs of the emergent new order of machinery. Especially modernity in its singular mode is under attack. At best, it might be received in the fashion of plurality, as prescribed in the concept of multiple modernities. The opposing view inversely concedes definitely a multitude of Middle Ages, but asserts stubbornly solely one modernity, wrapped, however, in a variety of different cultural garbs. The pros and cons in the, use in the dispute are drifting far apart. Emphasis on dissimilar historically engendered conditions, especially the diagnostic exposition of an inner nexus, a correlation, so to say, between secularization, the creation of technology, and the production of social wealth, tends to evoke fundamental suspicion, as if its very revealing is meant to endorse ontological ranking. The thrilling contingency, however, is a unique epistemic core of early modern Western investigative research, its universal exceptionality founded on the principle of experimental openness to possible findings whatsoever. In present days, however, the ubiquitous desire of accepting Western te technological blessings while rejecting persistently their philosophical prerequisites is intriguing. Such irritating juxtapositions galvanize to unseal customary queries on the meaning and significance of enlightenment's legacy in the realm of ideas and of modernity's achievements in the domain 
of the material world. In the beginning was time accelerated, accelerated by man, and this in a progress, progressing avoidance of God. Human acceleration of time was indeed at the very heart of the process of secularization and profanation. Its early embodiment was engendered in the inversion of the printing press with movable types. Its later emergence was a mechanically conveyed and steam-driven device of movement, pressing the powers of nature into steel housings, supplanting and exceeding the metabolic velocity of human and animal bodily forces. The introduction of printing was probably the single most significant prerequisite for a first large-scale revolution in early pre-modernity, the transformation, the conversion, so to say, of wisdom into knowledge, as Elizabeth Eisenstein has intriguingly shown. The mechanically driven production, multiplying printed matters indefinitely, stripping the text from its previously enshrined aura of sacredness in an ongoing profanation, one of the most imperative requirements of later enlightenment. Walter Benjamin depicts the loss of aura enchantingly in his ironic piece concerning the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. The consequences of printing were indeed groundbreaking. Without printing, the Reformation and Enlightenment before the Enlightenment would barely have been able to exercise its trembling impact. Printing capacitated the single person by means of individu individually reading the Bible published in his or her vernacular to communicate directly with God. The virtually relentless mechanical repetition, the constant replication of one and the same in an, an accelerating motion of production was perceived by the religious authorities rightly as a head-on assault on divine control over time and its ritual orderings. That was not only true for the culture of Islam, which delayed the introduction of printing with movable types for about 300 years after its investiture in the West. In the realm of the Orthodox Church in Old Russia, the introduction of print was likewise seen as a vicious attack on God's solid order of the world of faith. By introducing printing in early century together with the reform of the Russian language, a language regarded as holy in Russian Orthodoxy, the notorious suspicion of strict believers habituated anyway rather in oral recitation of psalms than in reading of the Bible that printing as a mode of mechanical acceleration would give rise to an aftermath godless in its implication and consequences was fully confirmed. However, in an apparently remote region of the West, in early 18th century Scotland, reading skills in broad segments of the population were well anchored at a very early point in time. Published materials could count on an exceptionally large reading public. In its Calvinist, Presbyterian milieu, that readership was not only instructed universally in reading the Bible, but showed lasting interest in books with profane content, the sciences included. Even persons with only modest incomes, we were told, were able to boast quite substantial personal libraries. And whoever could not afford such a possession had free access to local lending libraries. Around 750, every municipality in Scotland, whatever its size, exhibited such a library. Seen from this perspective, Scotland emerges as a principal nation of producing knowledge, knowledge, knowledge all over, becoming the hothouse of a unique, of a modest, a prudent brand of enlightenment. 
The currents of enlightenment crystallizes by osmosis. Regionally diversified, they occurred non-simultaneously. If a watershed in time deems necessary, then the year of 1776 assumes an emblematic meaning. Several events culminate in that annus mirabilis. The publication of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in February. Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nation, the foundational opus of modern political economy, appeared in March. In July, the outbreak of the American Revolution was recorded. And in August, the death of the great Enlightenment philosopher and predecessor of Kant, David Hume, was registered. And, evidently, the patenting of the breech-loading flintlock rifle, the Ferguson rifle, by Major Patrick Ferguson, a Scottish officer in the British Army whose father, James Ferguson, a Scottish clergyman, was a close acquaintance of David Hume. The breech-loading flintlock rifle brought about a revolution in warfare to happen, since it permitted a rapidity of fire that previously was unimaginable and could be reloaded while squatting or lying prone. Its technology symbolized the other, the darker side of enlightenment, namely the increasing mechanization of killing. Ferguson himself fell in battle during the American Revolution. The Scottish Enlightenment is of a unique disposition. Its core signifi signifiers are grounded on the sentiments of a moral or common sense as a kind of intuitive judgment. The origin of common sense is rooted in the foundations of the Presbyterian denomination and its belief in a capacity all humans are blessed with, the capacity to distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil. Transposed philosophically, exercising power of judgment contributes to constant adjustment, a mode of pr pragmatic tuning anchored in religion and balancing between morality and utility on the basis of a liberty seen as granted to all. Inspired by the English trinity of the early Enlightenment by Francis Bacon, John Locke, and Isaac Newton, the current of Scottish Enlightenment flowering in the 18th century was founded on the scaffold of an intellectual academic tradition attached to the chairs for moral philosophy at the universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh. Aside from David Hume, who earned his living as a private scholar and later in the service of his majesty as an official and envoy, the sword of Adam Smith forms the epicenter of the ex exploration of a human knowledge, a philosophy of virtues based on pity, compassion, benevolence, and sympathy, namely that competence of a common or moral sense underpinning human action and relying on human solidarity, guided by a passion of compassion, later on adopted by Hannah Arendt as a key concept in her political thought and philosophy. In Arendt's somehow unjustly less appreciated book on revolution, she takes sides with the legacy of the American Revolution and the Scottish Enlightenment against its French contender. While the French Enlightenment tradition and its convulsive culmination and completion in the French Revolution severed willfully the last binding bounds to trans transcendence, its Scottish, British, and American adversaries presumed that without drawing on the immortal lawgiver, no lasting law might be established. And this, as Arendt continues to argue, in order to thwart the sovereign people becoming transformed into a bunch of criminals. The contrast of the French Enlightenment tradition to that of its mostly Scottish counterpart could not have been greater. While the latter intends to reconcile reason and faith, the former persists on reason's fundamental opposition to religion, 
owned on the salt of Rousseau and Voltaire and accompanied by the godless battle cry, Écrasé l'infâme. The Scottish Enlightenment's, Enlightenment's ultimate intent of human existence, however, might be summarized in a search for self-fulfillment, the attainment of happiness, a condition of emotional and mental satisfaction aiming at the reconciliation of selfishness with altruism in a higher form of morality, the supreme commandment of civilized behavior, so to say. That understanding relates to the teachings of Francis Hutcheson, Adam Smith's indirect predecessor as the chair for moral philosophy in Glasgow, who made freedom and the prerequisites of moral judgment the underpinning of a system of moral philosophy, the title of his posthumous oeuvre, aligned his thinking with the probably harshest assault on the institution of slavery at this time. From London to Philadelphia, a system of moral philosophy was to become the Bible of the abolitionists. Thomas Jefferson, the principal author of America's Declaration of Independence, based his arguments and ideas largely on the thinking of Hutchison when he enshrined the dictum of pursuit of happiness in the document. Not happiness in its greedy meaning as private welfare, but that of public happiness in participating in public life, a virtue Hannah Arendt would later denominate as one of the most desirable charms of liberty. When Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments was published in 1759, it was received with enthusiasm. Voltaire and Kant held the work in highest esteem, and his later opus magnum, The Wealth of Nations, made him the respected precursor of the discipline of modern economics and political economy. Also, moral philosophy and economics appear to focus on different domains of human existence. For Adam Smith, they are systematically intertwined. The first grounds a theory of moral sentiment. The second focuses on sentiments transformed into an economy of material life. The category of labor was identified as a foundational source in the creation of social wealth while due to labor's continuous division and differentiation, a constant rise in productivity is generated, enhanced by invention of technical devices. Consequently, knowledge and wealth are straightly tangled. The discernment for such an intersection derives from the fundamental epistemic commandment put forward by Scottish Enlightenment thought and stipulated in the watchword don't think, observe. Comprehending the phenomenon of division of labor as a constant process in differentiation of abilities and skills in production and as a principal source of social wealth was indeed an expression of simple observation in living reality, especially the observation, the rapid industrial, industrial advance in Glasgow in Adam Smith's lifetime and this in face of further acceleration of time by mechanical device as that of the steam engine, harnessing the tame power of nature while manipulating the production of energy. That all this happened to happen in Scotland might have been the result of a unique local fusion of theory and practice, the interconnectedness of institutions of higher learning as universities and other associations for research and the experimental working environment in the emerging factory system. Throughout Europe, the Scottish triangle of knowledge consisting of the natural sciences of math and medicine was granted special acknowledgement. In that seeking network scientific technical milieu at the time, it was not surprising that James Watt the inventor of the steam engine, or at least the one recognized as having applied that invention by means of pistons in rotational motion for the factory system, became closely acquainted with Adam Smith. 
a tight, in, a tight integration of different domains of creativity seemed at work. The figures of entrepreneur and engineer enmeshed in a veritable epistemic nexus within a reality permitted by the world of work, technological creativity, the production of social wealth, and above all, the philosophical reflection on the same. At the core of such a reflection perches the phenomenon of societal abstraction, the enigma of modernity. It appears with Adam Smith metaphorically as the image of the invisible hand. In modern social sciences, sciences, that imagery is transformed into the context of black box, indicating an unresolved epistemological query concerning first and foremost with the transformation from phenomena of the world of the micro into that of the macro. Adam Smith was by far not alone in coining of pictorial metaphors to describe new emerging phenomena opaque to the senses and hard to conceive in empirical terms. Thus Hegel generated the illustrated phrasing of Die List der Geschichte, the cunning of history, while for Marx, and not only for him, elusive societal realities tended to arise, as he put it, behind the back of the human agents. All in all, such and further metaphors for picturing the societal abstract are understood as intellectual endeavors to install some epistemological hold on occurrences caused by human action with nonetheless which nonetheless elude human understanding. The metaphor of the invisible hand, above all, discloses the modus operandi inherent in the then emerging secular transformations from transcendence, encrypted unpredictability as enshrined in the metaphor of God's finger, aiming previously at the direction of the proper path for human fate and action to the not less incomprehensive present rule of the invisible hand. Originally, the figure of the invisible hand has been borrowed by Adam Smith, as Emma Rothschild recently has shown, from the arsenal of literary imagery, such as Shakespeare's Macbeth or Voltaire's Oedipe. In Smith's entire oeuvre, that intermittently notorious image appears just three times, in each of his three books only once, and this not without a significant dose of irony. However, posterity inclines to identify Adam Smith's entire legacy through that emblematic metaphor, ignoring the ironic dimension embedded at its core, mocking the metaphysical imagery of humans in illustrating the impenetrability of the abstract. Such phenomenon of projection emerges especially in face of economic crisis. Then secularized modernity tends to evoke images from the world of faith. For example, the dazzling surprise that bad things might happen to good people an amazement aiming in the direction of theodicy. The, the reaction takes biblical dimension. Man quarrels with God, or it takes direct recourse to the delusion of conspiracy, shortcutting the complexity provided by reality, a fantastic surrogate for the unfathomed effect of the invisible hand, the prevalent metaphor for the impenetrability of abstraction. Let me come to a final end by evoking the amenities of moral judgment based on the legacy of enlightenment, and most notably the pragmatic prudence of the Scottish enlightenment, balancing between the engine of change as time accelerated and a prevailing catechontic bond through transcendence, while concomitantly honoring the entanglement between 
secularization, moderate political order, the creation of responsible technology, and the production of social wells, an experience of tradition behind which there is no relapse. True, even the most essential critique of enlightenment is guided by essentials of enlightenment. The smashing success of Michael Kehlmann's novel, Die Vermessung der Welt, about the passion for prestige. Minister Chavan, uh, President in Sasson, uh, Rector Stromza, colleagues, teachers, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is an honor for me to speak here uh, before this audience on such an occasion. I wish to thank Professor Dina for his enlightening talk and in no more than a few minutes respond to it very shortly. Professor Dina began his, began his talk with a return to the tradition of enlightenment after decades of suspicion and critique so deep we might almost be tempted to speak about the return of the repressed. I would like to return to this return and I too shall begin with Daniel Kilman's uh, best-selling novel, Measuring the World. Even though, as we have just heard, the character of the scientist is depicted with a touch of irony, it cannot be denied that the author painted him with a very loving, even admiring hand. It is a somewhat childlike admiration for the adventurer and explorer. The admiration of a child, it should be mentioned, belonging to the generation, Daniel Kelman's generation, as well as my own, for whom explorer was still a secret heart desire and not the name of a web browser. Professor Diner mentioned the ironic tone of the book. Allow me to dwell a little on this irony, which is by no means limited to the portrait of the enthusiastic scientist. At different points in, the, in his book, Kelman evokes, through his irony, aspects of the critique turned against the Enlightenment during the second half of the 20th century. Humboldt, for example, in his speech in the Scientific Conference of 1828 in Berlin, explains enthusiastically that our understa understanding of the world is reaching its destination. Everything was measured, he says. One last riddle remains, the power of magnetism. All the problems faced by humanity are about to disappear. Hunger, fear, disease. Who knows, he concludes, maybe even death. This fictional speech, read today, 80 years, 180 years later, cannot be accepted with anything but a warm, compassionate, ironic smile. Consider now this explanation, which Kelmans puts in the mouth of Humboldt during his research trip in Central and South America. Accurate mapping of New Spain, he says, may help populate new areas, accelerate the taming of nature, and guide the land's fate in positive directions. After a certain period of exposure to post-colonial theory, and with, and with terms such as globalization in mind, the reader cannot miss the irony of the passage. Or again, Humboldt, now examining the ancient Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan. He's saying, so much civilization and so much violence. What an odd combination. We who know the history of 20th century need no further explanation as to what Kilman is trying to tell us. All these allusions are not very sophisticated, to be sure, but the popular character of the work, as well as its spectacular success, as Professor Dino reminds us, may tell us something. They may tell us that this kind of basic awareness to the darker sides of enlightenment, to some of its regrettable consequences and outcomes, this awareness is today an inseparable part of the public common knowledge or even common sense. In another passage, Kelman caricatures the somewhat demeaning approach of the enlightenment towards art and literature. Artists forget their duty, he says, which is to show things as they are. Artistic inventions confuse the public, and novels lose their way in a labyrinth of lies because they mix their nonsense with historical figures. In spite of the obvious self-irony of the writer, the joke is on the old enlightened scientist who atti whose attitude towards art is soon to be overturned by the young emerging romanticism. 
and it is on this new coming romanticism that I wish to expand a moment longer. The figure of the explorer in this moment in history has a double meaning. Viewed from the perspective of the 18th century, he is the enlightened scientist, embodying the disenchantment of the world. From the perspective of the 19th, he is the romantic wanderer, embodying its re-enchantment. I would like to hang my argument here, so to speak, on a somewhat marginal point in the book, but nonetheless a very respectable point, one towering some 6,000 meters above sea level, namely the peak of the Chimborazo. One of the most amusing passages in the book describes Humboldt's hallucinatory conversation with his companion Bonplan while climbing the Chimborazo. But while reading it, I was suddenly reminded of another botanist who picked flowers on the Chimborazo. You may be familiar with his name. I am talking about Petr Schlemil. Schlemil, the literary character invented in 1813 by the romantic French-German poet and writer Adelbert von Chamisso, is the typical romantic outcast. After selling his shadow to the devil, he loses his position within society and with the help of the miraculous seven-leg boots, walks off to explore the world and the wonders of flora and fauna. A year later, in 1814, Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffmann writes his New Year's Eve adventure, where he whimsically lets Chamisso's Schlemil appear for a moment. The, narr the narrator, astonished at the strange, freshly gathered plants Schlemil is holding, asks him whether he is coming from the botanical garden. And I quote, he smiled in a strange way and replied slowly, if you were a botanist, you should have seen at a glance that these are alpine flora and that they are from the Chimborazo. He said the last part very softly, and you can guess that I felt a little strange. Chamisso was a botanist wanderer himself, who also participated in a scientific expedition, and so was, of course, his own model for the final scientific vocation of his hero. But I believe it is rather Humboldt's famous achievement of 1802, this ascent to the Chimborazo, still quite fresh in the public memory at the time, which echoes in Hoffman's version. Did Chamisso and Hoffman, following him, think about the person of the enlightened Humboldt when creating their Schlemil? Or is it rather the romantic Schlemil, who in some strange retrospect casts his shadow over Kelman's Humboldt? Either way, it is clear that of this long, complex, entangled tradition, nothing is ever lost, nor can ever be cast aside. Nothing learned along this way can be, so to speak, unlearned. The return to enlightenment cannot be a simple return, a naive one. Indeed, is there ever a naive return? At the end of his talk, Professor Diner told us that even the most essential critique of enlighten enlightenment is guided by essentials of enlightenment. I believe it would be no less true to say that any return to the enlightenment today is inevitably guided in part by this critique. Thank you.